So this is at the end of the document I sent out to you guys. Um, I also have it uploaded on the um, uh, that that the, our Google site here. So um, I have a folder for that that you can kind of see. I did a drawing. It's at the end of the document. You'll see. But I did a drawing with the students last fall as they did theirs. I kind of did uh, worked along with them and did a ten hour drawing. This will be a two week drawing. Okay, so um, we can. Um, is that, can I find? Uh, Hmm. Weird. I don't know why I have to sign in all of a sudden. Should we do a menu incognito? Because oh, no, new tab, new window. Somehow I got in. I was trying to use a. a a service to store my folders on and they asked me to go incognito now I can't go to my it might have logged me out that's weird oh well um, but you, you can you can find it it's uh I got into the into my oh well I'll have to research that you try to do one thing and it screws everything else up I hate technology um, okay so here's a it's just on here yeah I'll, I have the images here I can show you too So we're going to use a. We're going to have you be drawing a. If you can, you know, you you guys did a really good job. I thought with that book, that just that kind of line book drawing that we did, um, as a as a way to kind of start to deal with the idea of uh, creating um, um, perspective. You know, draw an object that has perspective. So you have a, a number of choices you can kind of pursue with this. Um, I did it in one of the videos, I'll show you here in a second, a uh, drawing of a book with a uh, rock on it, a couple books with a rock, rock, rock on it. Okay, that was the still life. Now, when you create your still life, what I want you to do is, again, clear a place to set these objects. I had like two sheets of paper behind this uh, uh, drawing of the cement block with a pumpkin on it. So I had a big kind of open space that, where I didn't have any uh, distractions, right? And I could light it in, in such a way that uh, you know, it, it uh, gave a nice cast shadow and relative contrast and all that stuff. All the stuff we talked about in the uh, prior uh, project in terms of uh, um, uh, shadows, uh, relative contrast, cast shadows, highlights, you know, all that stuff. Um, with this one, though, you can you can block the drawing in. You may be you may block the drawing in if you like uh, using, uh, uh, you know, loose outline okay like we did with the book drawing okay so you can kind of see this is a 15 minute version right here okay so just these real rough um lines here that i kind of am figuring out i'm not going into any detail okay again this this sucks us into disaster usually when we want to get into detail too soon okay you know, this is what I was seeing when I drew, made the drawing. I'm going to show you the books I did too here in a second, but just try to give as many examples as possible. So this is the finished version. Okay, um, so that's ten hours into the drawing, right? You want us to use scribble to get the shading or cross? No, cross hatching. I'm going to go over that, Meredith. Okay, so it's a different build. It's a different mark making technique. Okay, for building it, for building value. Okay, and in this one, you can use the subtractive technique as well. Okay, and I'll show you that in the video here in a second. Uh, meaning you can you can um, uh, add light to the drawing. You know, lighter values to the drawing as you go using that pencil eraser. You know, that fine that fine pencil eraser I had you guys buy or the back of a regular pencil you know you can use i went through so many of these erasers regular pencils you know i just i bought pencil after pen packs of pencils just so i could use this eraser to uh, to uh, do the drawing um so you can see where you can go with the drawing so that's what my eye was seeing right all these dark shadows all the uh you know the modeling shadows on the pumpkin here again the pumpkin's back you know the cast shadow here um 
But this is what the way I had to start it. I had to think of it in very basic, simple terms to begin with. But notice, I don't know if you guys can see that, I still have, see these verticals and horizontals here, right? Now notice the horizontals here. Again, that's reminiscent of what we were doing, by the way, with the second exercise, uh, mark making exercise we did, right? I had you move the ruler. Now imagine when I'm doing this, and I'll show you in a second with the uh, with the video. But I just all I can, all, all I need to do is make verticals here, and then slide the ruler up the length of the side of this block, right? Or make diagonals here that run the, the along the edge parallel to the edge of the block and slide the ruler and I can quickly start to lay in this patchwork of horizontals and verticals in the drawing. So you can see as I develop the drawing over time how how much more complex these overlays get right as I build up the value over a long period of time. This is five hours into the drawing. Now, also, you can see I'm going in and erasing a little bit. See these eraser marks here? See these eraser marks here, these parallel hatches that are, um, I'm going back over and pulling away areas uh, with the eraser us using the straight edge, you know, uh, as well. Okay, I want you to use the straight edge for all everything you do. That straight edge is going to give you structure, give your drawing a sense of structure, okay? Um, and it's all in the video, and, and that, that's the book drawing, not the pumpkin drawing here. So we use the straight edge with the cork side up, right? Yes, yeah. So you can slide the ruler across the surface. That's correct. Yep, yep, yep. So you can slide the ruler. Yep, very good. Um, and here's a triptych panel of the last kind of. This is just a redo here. This one on the right of the one, the bigger one I just showed you. So you can see, like, ha like eight, eight hours into the drawing. That's a long time to spend on a drawing. Um, that's what I ended up. That's where I was right there. Okay, and to me that got boring. I was like, well, that's the, the. There's no energy in it. So let's move to. Well, this was what seven and a half hours. And by hour eight, eight hours in, I reinvigorated it with a lot more vitality. How did I do that? Lines and erasing lines. Yeah, a lot more linear action with the parallel hatches, right? I re-energize the drawing. So the hatching process is not only a way to build value in the drawing, it's a way to create expressive content in the drawing. Okay. Um, all I did was just go over the drawing just blindly almost with no, um, discernment, right? I'm just, I'm going to lay a bunch of marks down here. I'm just going to, going to reactivate this whole thing. I'm going to almost destroy it. And then with the, the eraser pencil and uh, my some more uh, lines, I can go back and start to recontrol that stuff again. It's a push pull, endless. This is this is add and subtract, add and subtract. So notice these marks in this drawing right here. Those little uh, parallel hatches going along that front edge right there. The finished version, those ba I backed off a little bit with those. How did I undo undo those? Race. Yeah, so I laid the ruler down and kind of erased it in the opposite direction with the pencil eraser a little bit to pull those back. Okay. Um, this is really pretty vital in here. So I went back here and just darkened the whole thing in more, right? And so I got rid of the marks by darkening in this whole area right here. Right? Okay. Um, notice, by the way, all the energy in the background. Do I sound like a broken record in terms of background and foreground? <laughs> that's what makes a complete drawing so by the end of the semester I would like you to figure out how to make a complete drawing right that's why we wait on that uh, you know we start to introduce that in the scribble drawing meaning you're putting marks everywhere on the drawing the whole drawing speaks to the viewer hopefully okay foreground even in the foreground the lightest areas in the drawing is the paper in front of the sentence block but I got a lot of got a ton of marks in there they're just burying each other over time right? See those? Those totally. Those I put those down here real quick. Just put some energy right there in the foreground, and for the most part, they're gone because I reworked that area many times over. Okay. So we're so conditioned when we don't make art, when we're new at it, to the fact that we see art and we think, "Oh, it's always been that way." I look at a Michelangelo, the Pietà, and I think, "Well, that was always that way." No, it was not always that way. It took a. There were a lot of I mean, literally th hundreds of thousands of variations of that sculpture that existed before the final variation, right? 
I mean, literally. So the um, problem is when we're connoisseurs, we don't think about that stuff. You know? When we become artists, you need to think about that. You need to give yourself the room to change and, and manipulate your drawing. Okay, um, That's called process, of course. right? Okay, so that's kind of an introductory to the what, what I've been kind of talking about. Now look at that first version. Look how empty, right? But it's a start. It's light and airy, and I'm giving myself room to move. Um, and then the finished version. Oh no, that's not the finished version, but wherever, wherever it went to. So those are that's a nice. I, I like those too. You know, this was maybe something like this value-wise. We talk about the value scale, right? Uh, a third of the hundred swaths of dark light to dark, right? We talked about in the last drawing. The light third, right? So uh, the value scale will be very light. That's what I kind of wanted with your last drawing because we didn't have a ton of time on it. Okay, But you can see how dark you can finally get it if you work 10 hours on a drawing or whatever, right? Okay, from that to that. That's where I started with this conversation. But you got to be patient. It doesn't happen in an hour. If it happens in an hour, it's going to look not good. <laughs> okay? Uh, if you're if you're striving to be a representational artist, uh, you draw something that you see and make it look like that thing. Okay. Okay. Any questions about this little kind of diatribe? No. Okay. Um, so the document I sent out kind of has that at the tail end, and then I talk about uh, some of the uh, different uh, hatching techniques here. All cross hatching is uh, is just this overlay of what's called parallel hatches. Okay, so uh, it's just these bundles of parallel lines that the artist's making that they're turning at different directions. Okay, that's what a cross hatch is. So maybe you make ten or fifteen parallel lines, bah, 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 bah. and then you turn and make another ten or fifteen lay over top of that, and lay over top of that, and lay over top of that until you get this overlay where they're all gathering. It's like the scribble. You spend more time in one area with your light scribbles. Those scribbles are going to gather and they're going to become a darker value. It's all going to mesh together, right? So where these parallel hatches overlay each other, that's all going to kind of coagulate, right, and become a lighter value, all right? Along with that is the idea of maybe pushing a little harder, whatever, you know, but it's more, more about the overlay and overlay and overlay of, of marks to create that what's called parallel hatching. To start with, though, before you do the parallel hatching, you got to, you know, learn about the I'm sorry, the cross hatching, you gotta learn how to, how to do parallel hatching. This is a Rembrandt print. Um, so up here you can see that the diagonal is an important, uh, you know, these lines are kind of running right here diagonally across this fireplace opening here, whatever that is. So all he did was just Now up here, still diagonal, but why does this value in here look darker than this value in here. Closer together. Closer together, yeah, yeah, there's closer. So there's more marks, in other words, right? So that's darkening up this whole area right here. Why does this area up here look even darker? There's layers. Yeah, and they're going different directions. So move to cross hatching there, right? So you can see the techniques here that he's incorporated master at all of this, of course. Just the layering of these, like this has a this one area right here above the head. We have diagonal marks going this way, 45 degree angle. We have and vertical marks going this way. Okay, up here we probably got diagonal marks going the other way, and horizontal marks, so that you you are creating that um, that sense of density. Okay, so it's darkening and creating density too. You know that's the beautiful thing about laying marks on a sheet of paper. It does make it darker, but it makes there's an energy in there that's more dense than the areas you're not addressing as much. And that creates weight. It creates an implied weight in the object that you're drawing, even though it isn't, doesn't have weight. Okay? That's why a, a drawing with a 10,000 marks has more presence than a drawing with, a, a, you know, 100 marks. All right? It's more information in the drawing. Okay. So this is a print, of course, uh, what ha uh, tradition, the tradition of printmaking goes way back. Uh, this is fine art printmaking, not kind of using a photocopier, right? Uh, even though that's, it could be seen as a different type of printmaking. Um, different processes going on here, but one of the processes of, of making printmaking uh, in etching is to carve into a, um, 
Uh, you, you get a metal plate, you, you coat it with tar. This sounds weird, but you coat it with tar, and then you uh, a, a tar-based material, and then you um, take a what's called a stylus, which is just a metal pointed tool, and you cut lines into the tar that's laying on the plate. Okay, and then you take that plate, probably usually copper, but they use different materials, with the tar on it and the lines cut in it. You go over to the what's called the acid bath, and you lay the plate and the tar and the cut-in lines in the acid bath. The acid goes down into the lines that have been cut into the tar, and what they call etch the plate. So they the the acid and metal don't get along. So the acid goes down and and cuts away a little bit of in the into the metal plate. So then you take that and you wash the tar off with a, with a, 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 a turpentine. And um, Paul, that I'm probably getting some of this wrong, but you know, for the most part. Um, and then um, you're left with a plate that has little grooves cut in it from the acid, which are the um, uh, which you know are the lines that the artist drew in the in the tar, right, and to begin with. And then you put ink on that plate. The ink goes down into those little lines that have been cut into the plate. You wipe the plate clean of the ink. Put a piece of paper on it, run it through a press, and then the paper pushes down into those little recesses that are cut into the plate, and you get the print. Okay. Now the reason that artists use the you know parallel hatches in this technique because they can't take if you're making prints you can't take a, a value and just smear it onto the print. I mean there are you know, you know uh, there are ways of doing that, but back in the day when they were started to do etching they didn't have those methods. Uh, lithographs, you can kind of get that 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 sort of quality. So lithographs, you often find, don't have this super linear quality that etchings have or engravings have. Okay, so so the printmakers, the, these artists who wanted to make prints, you know, so that they could reproduce their work, put them in books, you know, do a limited editions, um, uh, had to use cross hatching back in the day as a way to uh, get to the image. So it became a very popular uh, mark making tool to create, um, um, you know naturalistic or realistic rendering. So Rembrandt, of course, is a master at that. And so I just wanted to kind of show you one of his, his drawings that uh, uh, that he did. And a lot of, uh, and this one is, uh, where is it? Um, I have it here. I thought I had it. Oh, this one. This is a beautiful one. You know, lighter value, right? So he's probably breaking uh, parallel lines over the whole thing and then then going in and doing a little bit on the body here for a little bit darkness and then then super dark here a lot of diagonals and you know but you look close it's just this kind of big abstract mess as is anything is when you look at it closely it'll fall apart falls apart look at your look at you know look at the tabletop and look at the molecular structure of the tabletop it's not a tabletop anymore right it's just a bunch of atoms flying around so um, that's kind of the beauty of art is both an abstract experience and also a representational experience um, so here's a that's a print that he did and I love that um, okay a Durer a uh, great uh, German uh, artist uh, also a printmaker wonderful printmaker and draftsman um, he did the uh, this print of I think I have the of Saint Jerome somewhere here do I have the full version yeah there it is so this is in the document I sent you look at the magnificence of that he's a Renaissance artist uh, uh, Rembrandt's a little later uh, broke um, so this ha his work has a much more kind of pristine Rembrandt was a little more expressionistic uh, just because the the Baroque artists you know kind of saw things in a different way you know developed the, uh, their work in a different more expressionistic way whereas Durer is more of the Renaissance more kind of analytical so you can kind of see you know very kind of uh, precision based uh, kind of re uh, rendering here right and this is a print again okay so this would be I think he might have done etchings instead of uh, um, I'm not sure, but this might be an etch etching. So, and that's where you actually like chisel right into the metal without using that acid bath technique. Um, but it, this whole drawing is a, a result of these little little marks that gather. Okay, and I, I blew up a certain section here so we can kind of talk about it. So, in terms of the cross hatching, Rembrandt's cross hatching was a little more random, right? It didn't it didn't necessarily. Um, um, conform to the the objects he was trying to render okay but if you look at Durer's um, uh, cross hatching here and parallel hatching he's conforming to the objects he's trying to render okay and that's reinforcing this idea of perspective okay so look at the um, 
see the can you see these like this implication of these diagonal marks that are kind of running out from this object here this step they're kind of going along the edge of the edge of the next step right here so he's paralleling with these marks you can see my cursive cursor going there this edge and this edge. So he's using the mark making process to reinforce the plane of this step. Likewise here, we got vert, uh, horizontal lines coming out across this plane, moving left and right, 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 and probably some uh, stippling or some implication of, of lines moving in the direction of that plane back in space at the same time. So that's a case in point where, and look at the horizontals here. Horizontal, 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 horizontal. You get to the animals here, all, you know, um, all bets are off. They're very random mark making there, right? But the structure of these parallel hatches relay the planier nature of that plane that he's trying to reveal. So you can use the parallel and cross hatching as a way to be expressive and go in kind of multiple directions, or you can use it as a, as a way to reveal the sense of perspective of a particular plane that you're drawing, okay? like I did to when I first started this drawing, right? I made these go up and down and diagonal along the, the length of the block here. So I'm conforming my parallel hatches to the plane of the front of that block. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. Okay. It's a way to create, to reinforce the a particular plane that you might be drawing in the drawing. So the reason I'm having you to use a, find objects that have geometric nature, like books, um, that sort of thing, uh, and organic objects in the same drawing, is that it gives you a chance to experiment with the um, with the cross hatching in different ways. Um, so the pumpkin obviously is not a. So I can kind of go random directions here. I did a lot of racing in this one, but I can kind of go random directions here with the, the, the creation of this image, right? Just 45 degree angle, vertical, all that. Notice also when I did the pumpkin, I just didn't put a curve there. How did I render the shape of that pumpkin? By layering values. Yeah, by layering values on the front, but what about the, the edges of it? How did oh, I- cast shadow. cast shadow. There's cast shadows, but what, what did I, I didn't use a curve. What did I use instead of a curve for the shape of that? Parallel one? lines. Straight lines. Straight lines right here. Right, yeah. Right here. Yeah. Straight, straight, straight. These are facets, okay? So I use my ruler. I use a ruler in everything I did in this drawing. So the ruler can create a sense of arc if you understand it. In fact, uh, uh, curves, I don't know if I ever talked about this, but curves, are a very difficult thing to draw. So I always draw a curve using, um, let's see. I threw this one in here. I, I have it in a different video, but this is an interesting, if you have time, you know, I know we don't have time, but um, when you're drawing curved objects, it's always good to think about, I think I have it in this one. Yeah, this is at the end of the playlist that's on this. So, yeah, those are curves. Cool, big deal. If you don't have a if you don't have a French curve to draw them, it's going to be very difficult to do that. So you got to break down a curve into faceted movements, and those faceted movements are angles on your sheet of paper. So notice, I can break that curve down into these shifting straight lines red the red by denoted by the red line here angle angle and long angle so that what was this soft curve initially now you, maybe you get away with drawing that curve but do you know its position relative to the verticals and horizontals i.e the edges of the paper no you don't know that until you start to think about the trajectory of that curve. What is the angle of this? This is a horizontal right there, obviously. So the apex or the top of that curve is a would be a, a, aligned with a horizontal line, you know, straight line. So you can see thinking about angle when you do curvilinear forms, really important. 
Paulette, we talk about this in Life Drawing, right? That's a long time ago. I know, I know. <laughs> but you know, everybody wants to draw the curve of the, in a, life, in a figure drawing class, draw somebody bodies, you know, posing. All the drawings look like rubber. Like the, the, the people are made rubber because the students aren't thinking about the angles of the certain limbs or whatever. You know, said those are facets. Very important when you draw the human form. You guys interested in comic book art? Um, those those guys are masters at this. They're masters at understanding how to create uh, curvilinear forms through um, through angles. Okay. So this video is in there. It's a, kind of a nice one because. Um, because I'm having you draw an organic shape, right? You know, so um, so this might be worth taking a look at as well. So just by kind of, and then what you do at the end of the drawing, after you get those straight lines in there, then you just, you know, round everything off. And you can just throw, you know, rub it right in and you, you end up with a nice arc then, okay? Um, this is a very complex, uh, sophisticated uh, thing to think about, but it's really important to kind of um, uh, think about this stuff. Okay, so, so, you know, of course, um, different technique here when he gets to, you know, he's, he's doing like stippling and kind of dots and all that sort of stuff, right? So that's not cross hatching per se, but there are some implication of what's called contour hatching. And all contour hatching is, is parallel hatches that run in a curved, this is very difficult to do, but that run in a curved fashion that are revealing the curvature or the contour of a particular surface. So you can see the neck here. He's parallel hatching. He, these, these are just parallel hatches, but they're kind of running in a subtle curve, right? So that they are creating that, that illusion of, of these lines laying on the neck, literally, right? On the roundness of the neck. It's a trick that uh, people use to create, and it's happening down here as well. See the curved lines right down here? Curve, 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 curve. That's relaying the curvature of the kind of breast area right here, right? Okay. So that's using parallel hatching, what's called contour hatching, because you're revealing the contour of a form, curvature of the form. Okay. That's happening. This is a Durer piece here too. You can kind of see the curve of these parallel lines. Right. You'll be able to see it better when you look at the document. Now he's using some highlight here, some chalk or something on top of this, but okay. See the curved parallel lines here, curve, curve. It's all hatching, but it's it's all parallel hatching, but they're curved. So three types of hatching: parallel hatching, cross hatching, and contour hatching. Okay. I don't want you to do the uh, in this drawing the contour hatching. I just want you to do parallel hatching and cross hatching. And using that angle technique, uh, you can kind of start to develop a sense of organic structure. Um, let stuff go. Is this all done with the HB pencil again? Yeah, yeah, and then I move into a darker one, maybe at the end, the end of the drawing. Okay. Um, so this is, is not cross hatching. This is not far enough in the process here, but I'm. You can start to go in different directions. See, I'm starting to kind of get the curve of this top of this rock here by going up, down, up, down, up, down. But it's very blocky to begin with. What's that, Jeremy? I asked if uh, that drawing was all cross hatching. This one. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I'll, I'll show you uh, excerpts from it here. Um, this is driving me nuts that I can't get into my account. Um, so this is the end result here. Okay. Again, we'll, we'll do it before. This is a three part series. Um, again, look at the videos. So. Um, is that an apple or something? Or? This is a little ball just sitting there. Mm -hmm. And that's, I did that because you can kind of see that that is a, a series of these angled hatches that are going at different angles, right? They're laying over top of it. And I even drew the ball by going angles here, right? So, uh, and the rock certainly you can kind of see the facets I'm starting to uh, create on the rock there. Um, parallel, see these lines are 
running the direction of the edges of the book here, right, as I develop this. But before I got into that point, right, now here when I get to the end of the drawing, I'm throwing a few little free lines in there just to kind of re reveal some texture of the book or of the Brock there, right? But I'm thinking about cast shadow, you know, um, and again activating the background here, right? Let's see the finished version. Um, so I got a lot of energy up here up through these lines up here. They weren't here, were they here then? Yeah, so, so look at the difference, you know, I mitigated them. Very active here, right? Blah, blah, blah. Lots of energy, lots of energy. And sliding the ruler. So as I go, you know, you see, you can see it in the video, but I just want to back up here just for a second. See how I, I'm sliding the ruler as I lay those marks down there? You guys are looking, right? Yeah. Now I'm yeah. using the racer, right? So I'm, I'm laying the ruler down. Trying to get those little kind of highlights in the ridges where the book. Right? So we're just using the tip of the eraser, not the big eraser. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Now there, I'm using. Uh, notice what I did. I used the. You can use the ruler as a way to. Shield. So. I have a slower version here too. So, there I'm sliding the ruler, as I go. Right. I do it here. There's just a bunch of different techniques in here, but so right there I shielded. I was protecting the rock and so I laid the ruler along the edge of this rock and then I just did some parallel hatches and bumped into the ruler as I went down the length of the ruler. So I can, I can use the ruler as a shield against which I can kind of go da, 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 if I don't want to get those parallel hatches onto another area, right? So I'm going right down or I can use the ruler as a guide and then slide it as I do my parallel hatches. This is a technique, right? And art is technique. Nothing more, nothing less, right? You know, know how to play the piano. You'll never be a piano player, right? Okay? So, um, if you don't know how to draw, you'll never be a draftsman, okay? So, technique is really important here, okay? Um, so, this, these uh, videos, that there's three of them here in this series. You can see how I started it out. This gives a good. And I walk through this. There's my setup. I just wanted to kind of, I narrate it too. So there's what I was looking at. Zach, you're watching, right? And I narrate this, so I just kind of started this on. So that's what I was looking at. And I wasn't looking at a photograph, I wasn't looking at a video, I was actually looking at the real thing. So the first question is when you start your drawing, when you get your setup, is this idea, like when I mentioned that we wanted this to be a more finished drawing, right? How, am I just plopping stuff down in the middle of a big empty sheet of paper or do I need to think about the energy, this composition, this is not a design class, but we need to think about that, is creating Okay. Yes, I do need to think about this. So as I block this drawing in, I need to think about the negative spaces. Background, 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 foreground, foreground, you know, cast shadow area. So I walk through with you here this idea of mapping this drawing out. The rock, notice the rock's almost coming off the edge of the drawing up here. And the ball and its shadow are leaving the drawing down here. So I'm thinking about the edges of the format. Okay. Now as I'm blocking this in, I'm gonna always double check my angle approximation. Never ends. Those two parallel lines of that top of that uh, uh, top book, as they go back into infinity, they must do what? Neat. Yeah, they must get closer together, right? Back to the per perspective stuff. Back to thinking about verticals and horizontals. 
Zach, you're laughing a lot today. Or I'm, I'm sorry, Jeremy, you're laughing a lot today. Yeah, sorry. Am I funny? No, I'm just reading something alongside this. Oh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. um, Multitasking. Well, I'm, really, yeah. I'm, fully I, I'm usually not that funny, but today maybe I just, you know, uh, uh, tickled you for some reason. I don't know. Yeah, I get it. I'm sorry. All right. Uh, okay. All right. <laughs> oh, I'm pouring my heart into this, man. Right? You, you, you're, you're usually really right on, so I'm not being critical. Um, this is why the, the cameras are nice when I see your faces. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for doing that. Um, okay. So I, in, in the video, again, it's, a, it's I'm repeating because it's necessary because people forget about all this stuff. For instance, the angle of this book, what is it relative to a horizontal? Endless, endless stuff. Okay, so you either you either you either are interested in being getting good at drawing, or you're not. If you're interested in getting good at drawing, I would assume that's that you are because you took a drawing class. You got to think about all this stuff all the time. Okay, you can't let go of angle approximation, visual measurement, all that stuff. Okay, ah, there he is. So I'm obviously using, I'm figuring out the depth of this book relative to something else, right? Here's my setup. You may do this when you draw it. Make it go way up in the air and draw it like you're looking, hovering over top of it, right? So you would make these angles straight up and down. You make this a lot bigger than it actually is. There'd be no for shortening on there. Blah, 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 blah. Okay? So to block your drawing in, Draw lightly, and then all it is is starting to lay down value over time. So you can see here with this highlighted area went in with the eraser and did parallel hatches over top of what I had there. Didn't go the entire length. Parallel, longitudinal, cross hatching. The trick here is to move quickly. You come you come at the end of four or two weeks with a drawing that has uh, 800 lines in it, 800 uh, marks in it. It's going to pale in comparison to uh, somebody who has uh, 10,000 marks in their drawing. Because that's all you have to, to use is the overlay of marks. Notice I'm working, I'm going all over the drawing. I'm not, spent, I'm not trying to finish one, one area off. That's another thing that, student, that trap the students fall uh, prey to. They're going to get one area perfect. It's going to be perfectly dark. You know, the value is going to be perfect. And that's impossible to figure out because it's all relative. Everything's relative to everything else. So I wouldn't. I don't know the the value of the top of that book until um, I realize the value of the background or the value that's in in the rock. You know, some of those dark areas in the rock, et cetera, et cetera. So part of the reason I do these long videos is so that you can learn through uh, narrative, right? Because I narrate some of them, some of them I don't. But also learn through kind of uh, absorption, right? Through osmosis, through just like watching somebody create a, a finished drawing over time is of benefit. The, the downside is if you, uh, if you have problems paying attention, right? Um, to something that might be boring, <laughs> um, then you're not gonna you know, benefit from that, from that experience, right? So part of be learning is, you know, learning to discipline oneself in such a way that they can um, look or study or read or whatever the case may be, something that they're not 100% interested in. And then what happens in a miraculous sense sometimes is you become interested in it because you've slowed yourself down enough to, 
to take the time to really kind of think about all that, okay? So I think it's a great benefit for you to watch all three of these videos develop. Now, do you have the time in your life to do that? Maybe not, I don't know. Um, but I think they're there for you if you want to watch them and listen, because I do narrate these. Um, and you can kind Did of- you send uh, uh, videos too? Yeah, they're in the link. Oh, okay. That, that uh, the, the project description has a link to, uh, um, the project description has a link to the, um, the whole list of videos here. You'll see this when you, when you hit the link, you'll see this, okay? Uh -huh. Now, look at, I'm giving you a lot of stuff here. Yeah, I read right. the most material. Yeah, so the, all these all the, these videos relate to this project. Right. Now, I would maybe, this one I talk about <clears throat> lighting, right, in this one, drawing an open book and lighting. You know, you could do that if you want to and talk about angle, you know, you know repetition, same thing. This is all the stuff students throw away in their head when, they're, when they draw something. They don't care about angle anymore. They don't care about proportion. You know, it's just I'm going to draw a book and then it does, it's all out of whack, right? So we can't throw that stuff away. So in this, I talk about ang uh, lighting. This one, I'm doing a, di uh, a, a drawing of the open book. So it's just another, you know, I don't know if I narrate this one, but it's just a different version of the same thing. This is an open book. Same thing going on, okay? So um, repetition, repetition, repetition. If you want to get good at something, you repeat, you practice, practice, practice. As a teacher, I've got to give you repetition in terms of different scenarios as well. So, um, you know, while we've been on COVID lockdown here, I've been trying to figure out different ways to kind of reinforce this idea of how to do cross-hatching in a drawing, okay? Um, so that's down there. Th these are maybe a little less important, but they work okay. This one I did as a, uh, to begin with is a digital drawing, you know, so it has a little different quality. So you won't see my hand uh, doing it, but you'll be able to see how parallel hatches kind of can start to kind of create that sense of, um, volume and, and value in the drawing. Okay, so this is a little bit different vibe on this one, but but they're all there for you to um, to use, okay? And then uh, this one I did just to, uh, to give you a sense of how to lay the marks down real time. So, because uh, that was a really a valid, uh, um, a valid, valid uh, criticism of one of the students last semester. That they didn't get a sense of how long it took me to make the drawing, right? So this one, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you the sense because I had to speed it up, of course, because it took a long time to make the drawing. So I didn't want you sent through a 10 hour drawing, but that's about the speed. And notice how I'm moving around the drawing. Uh, I'll be always, you know, I'm doing visual measurement, angle approximation, trying to figure all that stuff out, sharpening my pencil, um, you know, doing, but it doesn't happen all at once. So there's a, there's a certain, um, certain pace to a drawing. And notice I'm not locking myself into anything certain. All the edges are ambiguous. I have no clean outline of anything, right? So uh, I just did a second drawing here just to show you. I I'm not, well, didn't do the whole drawing, of course, but just to show you how to start to block in that drawing. There's my parallel hatches just running along the edge of the ruler, right? Slide the ruler as I go, keeping that ruler vertical, right? So I get a series of these really nice vertical lines. That's what I wanted you to do with that second, uh, that second uh, um, uh, exercise that I had you do, okay? Now reassessing the angle of that edge, right? So just restating things, okay. So this this video is about that, just giving you a sense of. So they're all there in that, um, you know, in that. And then this one is the, uh, these three are the development of, uh, of that one, okay? So to get to the finished drawing. And that's sped up, of course. Okay, so you got a lot of video material there. You got a lot of reading here if you wanna kind of, you know, at least read all this stuff, right? But uh, it talks a little bit about the historical context there. Um, and then I just talk, oh, these are emails I sent. So as we were doing the drawing last year, I sent kind of reminder emails to the students. So you'll see that I put that in here, you know, notes from last semester. So that was my little uh, notes to them as they were working on their drawings. Cause we, we were doing, we were doing a drawing, all of us, you know, I'm not going to do it this time, but you have the evidence here that I did it last time, a 10 hour drawing essentially, right? Eight to 10 hour drawing, um, um, you know, three, four hours this week. And four hours next week maybe. So by the end of Friday, or thereabouts, <laughs> we want something that looks value-wise, you know, somewhere around these two. And that'll be a graded piece. And then next week, we'll continue with it, keep working on it, and do a finished uh, piece.
you know, we'll finish the drawing in other words, right? So it's a two week process. And so by Friday, it'll be much more resolved using parallel hatches maybe as expressive, creating an overall vibe to the drawing, finished drawing, developed over a two week period. So you get two grades on this drawing. Mm. Full sheet, start with a, a, a 2H or something like that, HB, you know, middle, middle of the road pencil. And maybe by the end of next week, you'll be working with a 4B, 6B, something like that. Okay. So you got, what's in front of you today is figure out selection of objects. If you just have a stack of books, that's fine. If you don't have an organic object, that's cool. But, you know. Um, How about shoebox? Shoebox would be good. Try to avoid things that, um, yeah, maybe an open shoebox might be cool. You know, so you see yeah. it interior and exterior. Uh, maybe yeah. with even some of the, maybe it has a, a wrapping paper kind of floating out or something. That one might be a nice, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know. sometimes you have that paper inside where the shoes uh, came in. So, or something like that, you know. Try to avoid, uh, um, if I draw books, I take the, the covers off. You know, I take that paper cover off and just have the book there without all that text and pictures on the cover of the book. If you have those, right? So, um, like, you know, here's a book. You know, I would just draw, take that off, and so I don't have to deal with the text and all that stuff. Notice my book, by the way. Make it kind of interesting if you can. Um, the uh, I have a slightly different angles to each other, right? Not, none of these books are, are parallel to one another when I lined them up, just so I could make a little bit more interesting drawing. They're shifted relative to each other. And nothing's straight on to me either. It's all at a weird angle. Right. Not like that. Not like that. It's like this. You get that three-quarter thing or subtle three-quarter thing going on too as well. Um, if you want to do books, what else? Uh, da 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 da. And some good drawings. A couple good drawings last semester, but I'll I'll send some some student work out um, to show you. Um, I thought there was some nice stuff going on uh, last semester. So, um, guess that's it. Any questions? So we have class tomorrow too. Wednesday. Wednesday. Wednesday you mean, Mary? Yes. Mary? Um, in your, in your of, uh, I mean, in your oh no, that's that was just um, for the. I have a class on on Tuesdays as well. So, oh, okay. yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So I know I never had really worded it that way before, but uh, yeah. but the Tuesday Monday Tuesday class, the 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 Wednesday Thursday classes, the, the course morning classes are Q and A. So if you want to, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be here for you for you to answer some questions. Okay. Um, okay. Simple, simple. Okay. Oh. What? It doesn't look simple. Scary. Uh, yeah. Just draw lightly. Move, move quickly. Draw lightly. Move quickly. Draw lightly. Move quickly. Uh, a, a drawing with the, like I say, literally. I don't know this drawing. I said I, I revised it because I said here probably by the end of this ten-hour drawing here. I rewrote this when I sent it out to you. I had like 5,000 to 10,000 marks. I'm thinking probably even 10,000 to 20,000 marks, you know, both add and subtract, right? Watch the videos, it'll show you how to use the eraser in the finished drawing, probably. Versus a drawing that may have people go super slow and they have, let's say, 2,000 marks. A lot less information, a lot less documentation, a lot less observing of the object, a lot less kind of just flow of information onto the surface of the sheet of paper. So the quicker you can move, look at that, that video of me, the pace I could move at, right? It's a rhythm, and that rhythm shows up in the finished drawing, by the way. That's what beauty is about rhythm, right? So that pacing, that rhythm shows up in the drawing with the, the delegation of these marks, okay? Also, the speed sometimes looks like make the mark helps too. There's a rapid, but I'm not pushing hard, but it injects this kind of little spurt of energy into the drawing. This is all really sophisticated stuff that you're probably not gonna get in a lot of classes, but uh, um, because it's so 
uh, it's so hard just to teach perspective, for instance, right? So this 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 overlay of all this other stuff is uh, very uh, very complex in, in terms of creating a, a, a finished work of art. Um, not that I'm any better than any other teacher. The but erasing, the erasing marks with the pencil, those yeah. are also considered marks, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Yep, yep. So those erasing yeah. marks are marks as well. Why? Because you're putting a white mark, essentially, if you do it right, onto a, a, a toned surface, right? There's already marks on there. So these erasure marks become white marks on the drawing. That's a very good point. So this over here, this highlighted area right behind here, and look at the relative value, dark brick or dark of the cement block, really bright background here. Light was hidden back there. And then as I moved up, I let up on the, you know, the value gets more neutral here. Right? But yeah, so there's, this is a series of me going over that with white eraser to create those white marks there, okay? So they, they the white marks play a role in the, in the drawing as well, as the dark marks. Look at all the cross hatching in this background. Notice this dark in the corner, dark in the corner, dark in the corner, so I can kind of control the drawing by dealing with the value of the perimeter of the drawing, right? It's almost framing it, right? It's a technique that you can play around with. Notice the angularity of these marks as I extend out from the pumpkin here. I just kept going with that mark. I like that. It felt like the, the pumpkin was creating a vibration in space, right? So why not go with that in your drawing? There's this kind of echo quality here, right? I like that. I kept that. That's a pretty cool thing. So there's a, a case in point using parallel lines as an expressive tool here, right? The pumpkin is like speaking out into the world, like the, the scream, right? Monk's scream, echoing out into the world, right? It's a cool, Im a cool image, a cool kind of effect. I liked it and I kept it. Right? So, um, so the, the parallel lines can be both expressive and uh, utilitarian in terms of building value and revealing plane, right? Really revealing perspective as I outlined. Okay, I'm getting tired. <laughs> burning out. We're all burning out, I think, this part of the semester. So you do have some lines that are edge light edges. Yes, yeah. At the end of the drawing I'll go in. At the end. Yeah, okay. see how I kind of put a line in right there, right? At the end. And then just feathered right up to it. It's not dissimilar from the, the what we talked about with the scribble. You could put a line right. in at the end of the drawing, you know, once you find where that edge is, and then just backfill a little bit and feather it in either to the background or the or the object, and you got a, a really crisp edge then, right? See that? And you erased up to that. Yeah, and then I would lay the ruler down mm -hmm. to protect okay. that, right? And then yeah. go, then take my eraser and erase down to it. So I'm mm -hmm. laying the ruler along that edge, protecting the dark edge, and taking the eraser and racing up to it this way or going along the edge this way to create that really crisp, clean edge at the end of the drawing, right? right? Same with these interior views, right? That took a while to work that. Look at the little angles here. That was difficult. Angle, angle, right? It's not just a curve. That's a tricky one. Angle, angle. Now look at all the... I had the other side I had to deal with. You see through this thing. So I got the background here. I had a neutral value here. And I have a dark value in here. And then all the while I had to navigate this curve with the straight edge. Very difficult. Well, do you want us to lay down a surface over the whole surface? In the yeah, you could do that. That's a good question. So Paulette's asking, should I just start with a matrix? Sometimes I do that. I noted that in one of the videos or in the well, right statement. I'll just kind of go in and start to do that light, really, really light, just to get an energy flow going in the drawing. That makes the drawing not so precious, right? All of a sudden, I got a bunch of marks going around, light, I mean super light, on the drawing that I can then start to play around with in terms of picking and choosing some of those to start to carve into forms, whatever I happen to be drawing, okay? But that's a good suggestion, Paul. You don't have to do that, but I tend to find that it, it relaxes me a little bit if I have marks already on the drawing that aren't, don't mean anything but are very light, like the light scribbles, right? Like when we did the, the scribble drawing. Okay. Just put scribbles over the whole thing and then just start to pull out your f forms from that. Um, so everybody understands what Paulette's asking there, right? Before you even start the drawing, lay, lay marks on the paper just to get the flow, a flow going of something, okay? But super light, okay? You don't want to lock yourself in. And then start to block in the drawing, okay, once you do that, okay? I did that in this drawing, I believe, Paulette. Uh, I think I did it in, I don't know if I did it in one of these or not, but miss maybe not, I don't know. Yeah, see I'm just kind of playing there, right? 
there's no nothing there yet so this is an interesting to, one to watch I just start laying marks down and tell me when you can start to see the this is the open book drawing tell me when you can start to see the open book emerge mm. Mm. there yeah what's mm -hmm. given what's giving you the clue that, that it's a, a book laying open well, just because they, well, I know what I'm looking for. Yeah, yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. But that, there with those um, curved. Yeah, up here, you know, the, contour, yeah. yeah, these these lines right up here, right? And um, so I'm starting to give the curve of the book as it's laying open. I'm gathering marks, right? I'm just gathering marks in areas that uh, I perceive as the eventual edge of the drawing, of the edges of the book, right? I'm just gathering marks. This is a really nice way to think about this because we're precisionists, right, by nature. Humans are precisionists. We want what we do to be correct the first time we do it, and it, it can't be. So I'm just kind of trying to get a sense of, as I'm starting this drawing, and then I'll fast forward here just to show you. So I keep doing that over and over again. Do you have a demo of this as well? A what? Do you have a demo of an open book drawing? Yeah, it's on the, it's that list. It's it's the uh, list that I gave you guys. This playlist that's in that. Uh, if you go click that link in the thing I sent, Paul, that, that all these videos will open up. You'll see. You'll be able to select them. Okay. So over time, then you start to hone. I guess again, sculpture, sculpture, sculpture. Leonardo, or I'm sorry, Michelangelo, the Pieta, really smooth, beautiful flesh of Mary holding Jesus. Now that didn't happen at the beginning of the sculpt creation of the sculpture. It happened at the end of the creation of the sculpture. That's smoothing out the surface and all that stuff. So, so this is a good video to give you a sense of that. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, all these, uh, Paul. When you go to the link in the document right here, let me get pull it up just so you can kind of have it, and then I'll send you guys on your way. Um, so read over the document, and right here the drawings, and then I go right there, right to that. And that will open up all these videos. Okay. Do you just recommend just diving in, or you know, practicing, or? Well, that's a good, another good question. Probably since this is all new to you guys, you may. I would just dive in, with the um, caveat that knowing that you probably have to start it two or three times. Yeah, you mentioned that in yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's not gonna, you're gonna go too dark. Probably the composition's not gonna be right. You know, you may because even though we're using subtracting, erasing in this, um, it may be easier just to start a new drawing. Maybe it'd be too scale. The the objects would be too small in the drawing. You know, all those sorts of issues might arise. Oh, time to scrap it. But if you find yourself doing that five times, then you're avoiding. Uh, you're, it's avoidance issues. Okay. <laughs> um, so. Uh, don't do that too much, but sometimes you have to turn the paper over and start again. Yeah, yeah. So, but I would go in with the mindset this is going to be the one, okay. But with the mindset that you have a, a escape hatch. That's okay. always a good kind of place to be in art, I think. So, okay. You have a what? Escape hatch, meaning you can or turn the escape hatch. Yeah, turn the paper over. <laughs> okay.